So, you know what our study was about. You know what we did. You knew, know that we were hunting for three generations of families who never worked, and we've told you what we found, etc. In, in doing that research, we think we interviewed families who look very much like what the government calls troubled families. And so we want to say in this paper a few things about what we might have learnt from that research. I suppose it's partly about our position here as well, because academic social scientists, for very many good reasons, often want to dismiss what the Westminster government might say about troubled families because this is demonising the poor and stigmatising the poor. And it certainly is in many cases. But on the other hand, we, from our research, we know there's something going on, just to put it in that rough way. There are families which face severe and multiple disadvantages who find themselves in real trouble and sometimes cause real trouble. Uh, and we spoke to some of them. And so what we want to do here is talk to you a little bit about what we would say about those families from having had discussions with them and from some of the things we might learn from that discussion for agendas like the Troubled Families Agenda. Okay, the sorts of issues that, that um, came up with the families that we talked to are the ones that, that we list here. Some of the families we spoke to experienced all of these. Um, a good number of them did, actually. So, um, very poor experiences of school, leaving with few and no qualifications. Um, of course, long-term worklessness, although we might raise a question about the younger generation because the, many of them are relatively new to the labour market. Um, there was a good deal of antisocial behaviour, offending and victimisation. Problematic drug and alcohol use, particularly in the mid-generation. We found physical, sexual and emotional abuse in some of the interviews, and as I said before, these, these interviews were very long, detailed and extremely um, harrowing. There was a good deal of violence in the, in the interviews that, that we did, and typically, and not unsurprisingly, the most common problem across all of the families was ill health. And of course, poverty, um, it's very significant for our families. And we, we had lots of interesting debates in trying to think about the research and how, how we might um, theorise and how we might present our uh, research because we were aware that, the, that there was a, a kind of danger that um, what, what we found within our families might be perceived as broken Britain or that it might feed into some of the um, agendas that we've been hearing about. So our families faced a very complex web of hardships and traumas. Now we want to just give one case study here and it is a, um, a harrowing story. We're going to talk about Amanda who, who I interviewed and she's really a um, very, very interesting woman but she'd had a, a, a very, very difficult life and then we'll go on to talk a little bit about her daughter. She came from a, a relatively middle class um, background but she had a very difficult childhood. There was emotional, physical and evidence of sexual abuse in, in her childhood and she, she really became very troubled when she was at school and she described um, angry outbursts which were largely kind of dealt with in ways that didn't seem um, particularly helpful. So she's eventually um, excluded from school. She did work when she initially left school, but she went through a, a, a series of relationships and she ended up having five children, all of whom were taken into care at various points. And she described how she moved through relationships to try and escape what was happening to her. And I think that's a theme that we often picked up in our, in our interviews, that there's a sense of wanting to escape from problems and taking steps to do that, but in doing that, perhaps entering new difficulties and new problems. So she talks about getting married, 
um, and, and looking to her husband to, to kind of rescue her from the difficulties she felt um, she had with her, her family. So she goes through a string a uh, series of relationships, and all of the, the men that she, um, she has relationships are, are abusive towards her. Um, she has uh, children, and as her, her biography goes on, she, as her children are taken into care, she really struggles. She talks in the interviews about really feeling that she couldn't be a good mum and she was worried about that maybe she would repeat some of the things that had happened to her and she became depressed and she was dealing with um, just a whole series of things that were happening to her. So very, very complex story. She witnessed um, just a, what is actually quite a big example, but it, for her it was just something that happened. She lived in a neighbourhood. Um, a, a young man was murdered one Saturday afternoon by somebody with a sword in the, in the street. She witnessed it. She was pushing her children along. And this had quite a significant impact on her and her children, but it was just one example of lots of things that were happening to Amanda. We give an example here. When I, when I interviewed her, she was 49, and she described in a very long interview all of the things that had happened over her life. But she talked about um, she'd, she'd taken a job in Burger Delight. You can guess um, where that is. <laughs> and I think when we, we talked earlier about the importance of the low pay, no pay cycle and this issue of churning, and she gave a really... Um, interesting interview and she described the experience of going to work at Burger Delight at 40, 49 having not not really worked for many many years and um, I think the example there you know they're screaming at her she's um, you know she's really describing the the experience of being in the in this job which is really pretty um, horrific and um, she becomes ill and she ends up um, losing that job so so a nice kind of example of the, the churning that we might pick up in some of the discussions. So um, to move then to Diane, which is... Say yeah. about that, about the, uh, about, uh, Amanda. So under the Government's Troubled Families uh, Initiative and some early results have just been published, uh, a family is deemed to have been, quote, turned around if one of a number of measures have been met. And one of those measures is, has returned, you know, has moved off benefits and returned to the job. So... If Amanda had been within the Troubled Families agenda, her moving to Berg Delight would have meant that she and her family were classed as having been turned around, that this would be the successful outcome. So one of the things we want to sort of stress is, well, you know, where do interventions lead? Where do uh, initiatives to move people from workers to work take people? Uh, okay, so let's talk a little bit about Diane, her daughter. So we're talking about families and talking about generations. Um, Diane's story was uh, that she was brought up by Amanda till she was eight, taken into care because of physical ab ab abuse by Amanda. So a pattern, you would see, down the generations of abuse. She says, it had an effect on the way I behaved. I used to get out, get drunk, get arrested, never go into the home. They didn't really make you do anything. It, was not, it wasn't like a family. It was just coming and going. School, interesting. Many of our interviewees said this school was all right till I was about 13. But then we got in quote with the wrong people, got expelled, alternative education, left school at 16 with no qualifications, became pregnant. This isn't a completely dissimilar story to Amanda's story. She got a job, a first job, her only job, in a call centre. She was, uh, uh, I think she was 16, pregnant, and got a first job. Uh, she got sacked after three months because she didn't miss, make her targets in the call centre. Her son <laughs> was immediately placed on an at-risk register, very heavy social services interventions, including 24-hour supervision. Uh, her elder sister tried to force the adoption of Callum, her son. Now, I think the quotation here that's presented is, is important because it shows how Diane feels about a lot of the things that get said about troubled families and about the idea of things repeating themselves down the generation. I proved her wrong, her sister, and I proved everyone else wrong. I was being labelled. Just because I've been in care doesn't mean that what happened to me doesn't mean I'm going to do the same thing. 
Just because my mum used to batter me doesn't mean I'm going to batter my kids. I think it's true sometimes that maybe other people, they wouldn't do it because it's been done to them. They know how it feels to be left out and abused by people so they wouldn't do it. They'd make the child's life different to make them feel better, have a happy childhood. Now, at, at 23, she'd recently had a chance of a job, a part-time job, but she turned it down. It just was going to be too expensive to do in terms of the antisocial hours uh, and the inability to find a sort of flexible uh, uh, childcare that would allow her to do that job. But her attitude to employment was this, hopefully when I get a job, I'll keep my job and I'll show him. Now she's talking about her son, Callum, I'll show him. He won't end up in care. He won't end up having a kid at 16. He won't end up doing the things that I've done. I want it to change. I wouldn't want to sit in a council house doing now with my life. Do you know what I mean? I want to show Callum that what you work, you get nice things from working. People have might have got a bit more respect for you. So, some summary, uh, hopefully allowing some time for questions. We would use the same sorts of words that Louise Casey does, uh, writing the Listening to Troubled Families report. Very clearly, these were long-term, complex, entrenched, and cumulative sorts of troubles and problems that were impacting on these families. There were spiraling troubles that often stem back from childhood. This is Amanda's phrase. That just, it just keeps going like this, stack, stack, stack. Now, there was the, the, the Louise Casey's government report listening to troubled families. It says, uh, on the face of it, superficially, it's very similar to some of the things that we say, except her report doesn't use the word poverty once. Poverty was a uniform and underlying experience for all the families that we spoke to. These people were leading extremely precarious lives. It's much harder to cope with the problems that bang into your life if you're also living in poverty. Some concluding thoughts in terms of the troubled families agenda altogether and where, where you know, this is work in progress and what we might think of it. But I think one thing that we want to stress is that the families that we spoke to aren't typical. They're not typical of families in inverted commas Park Hill in Glasgow or East, inverted commas East Kelsby in Middlesbrough. They're not typical of workless families in Park Hill and, uh, 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 and East Kelby. Much more typical is that low pay, no pay churning story. These are unusual families. Because we were looking for this strange thing, three generations of families that never worked, we sort of dug down and down and down and spoke to extremely deprived, extremely disadvantaged families. So there is a strong potential in policy when we're talking about troubled families, to take this as the story about poor people. And it isn't. It's a story about a particularly dis disadvantaged group of poor people. I think there's some confusion uh, uh, in government rhetoric about troubled families, about individual and agentic views of poverty, that this is somehow all about family dysfunction or personal failures. Uh, you will have heard uh, a Minister of State recently saying that people who use food banks do so because of their failures over money management. It's that sort of view, I think, is represented here as well. So, for instance, in the Troubled Families Agenda, problematic drug use is highly implicated in government discourses about why the, 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 these families are in trouble. Yet we know that 93% uh, of those on benefits aren't problematic drug users, aren't problematic drug users. And in all of this, and I think this is one of the most important points, if you read some of the government literature on troubled families, nowhere do you find a sense of what the history of these places is. A place, Glasgow, which was what? A second city of the empire. Middlesbrough, one of the most prosperous towns, the most prosperous town in the country during the 1960s in terms of industrial production. What has been done to those places and to the families in those places to change the structure of opportunities to impoverish the people who live in them. So that's what is one of the things that I think is missing from some of these accounts of troubled families, a sense of the structure of opportunities and what is there for people. So even though you know, Amanda is now at age 49 trying to do the right thing and get a job, what is there for is a crap job working in burger delight, putting her hands down toilets, trying to pull out needles. 
And also in this agenda, I think what is missing is a real discussion of focus on well-being or ill health or health and ill health. If there was one problem or trouble that affected our families more than anything else was this problem about health and ill health. And again, if you look at the sort of government listening to, listening to troubled families report, it barely <coughs> is mentioned. But that was a sort of uniform experience for our, for our families. And very finally, we need to think more about how these families don't repeat the cycle change between generations, how young women like Diane are trying to re resist what might be seen as a family inheritance of abuse and trouble and difficulty to make her, her own life better and to make the life of her son Callum better. So these are just four or five questions that we would think need to be asked about a troubled family's agenda for policy and politics at the moment. Thank you very much. Thanks very much indeed to both Tracy and Rob. Fascinating stuff. Uh, we have 10 minutes or so for now to discuss it with them. Uh, same procedure as before, please. If you can raise a hand, we'll get a microphone to you. Uh, who'd like to kick us off, please? Hi, I'm Maureen Drennan, an individual, and I've been with Poverty Alliance for five and a half years. And I work down, well, I don't work actually, I'm actually unemployed. A mother of two, no grandchildren. Um, I work in observations, I work amongst drug and alcohol. Uh, as a volunteer and I actually with them and everything. I'm actually a service user myself. Um, it's been really interesting so far and the thing that came into my mind actually, do we actually like children? Do we actually value our families? Do we actually value our women and our daughters and all that kind of stuff? And it, it's really actually, as a mother myself, and I spoke to John earlier, I was brought my children up actually in rural Scotland in areas where there was no bus service, no cars, we had a car, no bus service, no shops, no schools. And I had to really actually work out the box. And I used to bring children to my house and I'd made sand pits and all sorts of things. And I've had 18 houses in 30 years and I've actually been like superwoman and I've loved every minute and it's been, I'm going to swear, it's been bloody hard work and I'm still standing. Um, I'm just recently, uh, I had a little bit of money left due to, down to a car crash. I'm now officially in the door because I have no savings left. I've been through a healthcare three times. I've had my money stopped seven times. Um, I love people. I've had six house moves in the last six years. I've been all over the Ayrshire communities. And I've been around uh, community centres and I've been just doing my own research. But I went away for three weeks, went to Manchester to see my son for nine days, eight, seven days in Berlin for nine, and then back to Manchester. Down in Manchester one time when I went down, actually, Evening News, they'd built an adventure playground in Moist Side for the families in Moist Side, the problem families you're talking about. This project now is the gates are closed. There was lack of money. Mm -hmm. My observation in Berlin, I was speaking to two or three people about this, and in Frankfurt, I've been to Frankfurt twice. In Berlin City, there's a, an adventure playground. Every, I'm not, I'm not even exaggerating, every street corner there's an adventure playground and they're not fenced in. There's areas actually, grass, sand, climbing frames, swings. I was there for nine days, I didn't hear a child cry. Mm. The streets were filled with children, all smiling, the dogs were smiling, the couples didn't, there were no arguments. You okay. know, Glasgow Let said, me stop no, you then, we'll get some responses in. It's a fair point. Families. Yeah. You know, there's nothing, in, the, in Scotland actually, in England, there's actually areas where they're, they're not even fit for kids to play in. What's wrong with the city centre actually? Free access yeah. for play. You know, I'm a woman myself, I actually take the pressure off women. What we should have, our children should be ha having children should be fun. Okay. How do you and respond to that? We don't do enough to help people change. Yeah, it's really interesting. Thank you. I mean, one observation I would make, um, I was thinking about when you were talking, and one of the things that we reflected on in doing this work was what do we mean by work? Because the intergenerational cultures of yeah. worklessness discourse is about paid employment. But actually, what we found within our sample was people doing lots of work, of course, lots of caring, because there was so much ill health, but childcare as well, and that was through the generations. So lots of caring 
sharing, but also lots of voluntary work going on. And, it, and that was really interesting for us because I think that that sort of work is very hidden. So I think there maybe is more debate to be had around what do we actually mean by work and what do we value in terms of what, what people do. There's a, there's a different issue about how we might value paid work, and that's, that's very important in terms of the sorts of jobs that our um, samples were doing, but I think there is a broader question about work itself and what we mean by work. Take another point, please. Yes, at the back there. Um, that was going to be my point. I think, you know, has your research added to that debate about civic participation, volunteering, and caring? Because I think that that is absent, and it's absent from your five questions as well so I'm quite disappointed that it was always that focus on the agenda that's set by the agenda setters rather than starting the new a new narrative about it and I think you know civic participation caring is such a huge thing and we, we've we've seen the credit crunch we're going to go hit the caring crunch shortly where women are going to be not only caring for their young kids as they grow up but they're going to be caring for their elderly as they grow old so you know that pressure is going to if anything, increase over time. So I, I would be keen for you to not only respond to that here, but respond to that through some research to start setting some more of an agenda, because that's my biggest mm -hmm. disappointment about the narrative on employability for the last decade. Other of you want to come back on that? Well, <laughs> apart from to say, you know, fair point, uh, and that, you know, to reiterate what Tracy said, you know, the, 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 the dominant agenda or discourse or terms often talk about workless households. Now, we've tried to dismiss the idea of never worked households in our first presentation. But these were households, as Tracy mentions, where there was lots of work going on. And it is something that we write about elsewhere. So, you know, today we can only do, do some things. So, uh, you know, different forms of work, caring work, voluntary work, uh, some sorts of criminal work was undertaken by our participants, by particular types of our participants, I would say. Um, but if you like, connecting that question back to the first point, one of the things that are happening at the moment, not only with welfare reform and its various, I always put an in inverted commas, welfare reform, uh, but cuts to services at once, the, the opportunities for people to do the sorts of things that they were doing to get by and be okay are getting fewer not more. So the services that might be there to help a family with their children, or the, or the possibilities to, rather than be in, be in employment, to go and do voluntary work, it's actually getting harder for people rather than easier because of things that you will know as much about as I do. Just on that point, Rob, can you just say a word or two about the diversity of the families yeah. that were in your study? Because, I mean, researchers the world overlook for, for common factors. That's, that's yeah, what yeah, a researcher yeah, does. But it does strike to me that there's, there's this view that there's a type yeah. And I wondered if your research found any evidence for that at all, or if these are quite different people to whom similar things have happened. Whoa. Uh, yeah, sociologists look for patterns. We, uh, we have to look for, we have to get beyond saying it's all very complex and it's all very difficult. <laughs> and it, no, we don't say that. We don't say that because, because there are uh, patterns here. Now, there's, uh, I'll share with you, though, uh, one interesting difference by place, if I may which is not something we've talked about a lot in, in our published report, partly because we're dealing with small numbers here. We're only talking about 20 families in total, yeah. and if you start dividing them up, it gets it's really small. But one of the things we observed in terms of difference between Glasgow and Middlesbrough was the impact of heroin. Now, how does that work in this story? Now, we know Teesside reasonably well, knew Glasgow less well, but it's about biography and history of a place and the ages of the sample, if you like, the ages of the people that we spoke to, and when particular heroin markets hit particular places. So Glasgow's different to Middlesbrough in that Glasgow's major heroin outbreak started in the 1980s, yeah? Middlesbrough's didn't happen until the 1990s, the mid-1990s. Before that, there was no noticeable heroin footprint in Middlesbrough. Now, that had a real impact, real impact on the sorts of neighbourhoods we're talking to, talking about. It also means if you're growing up and living in those places and you're a 40-year-old man, uh, say, in Middlesbrough, it is unlikely you will have had any contact yeah. with heroin at all. Yeah? So the sample in Middlesbrough didn't tell... The, middle, the, parent, the parents didn't tell stories 
about problematic drug use, imprisonment, heroin use, prostitution, robbing to get enough money to, to, to provide for their gear, etc., and the health consequence. But they did in Glasgow. Thank you. There was a hand up at the back. Very, and that's, it's important to think about the diff, you know, because you can talk about deprived places or places that suffer deprivation and presume they're all the same. But yeah. they're not. There are some differences about. Yeah, I mean, what I was seeing was the danger of, of, of exchanging one set of stereotypes for another, which I'm sure we all want to avoid. Back in the room there. Yeah. I just want to ask why there is uh, no any mention about the asylum seekers and refugees, which are the vital part of the community. And here we are discussing the people who born here and suffering all these things. And we can imagine who left the country from a war zone or somewhere you have a a problem and you come into this country and you are in asylum process for a long time, sometimes the five or six years, for seven years, and as soon as you get the refugee status or permission to stay in this country, you need to go to find the jobs and the, where their qualification or the work experience is not recognized by this country and how much it affects on your child's health and the family, if you're a single mother, you know, it's a very, very difficult to survive. We should include something about this as well to this research and take it further um, into the implementation. Thank you. Was that involved in your sample talk? Were, were, were you uh, looking, talking to asylum seekers? The, the speaker is absolutely right. Uh, we do need research on that. I think the research on that is being done, not by us. Uh, it's just the nature of research projects. You have a particular question in mind I think uh, in, in, in the UK, theories about or myths about cultures of worklessness aren't about asylum seekers or, and aren't about refugees. There's a whole set of other debates and issues and things that are said about those groups, but it, the, the, the debates about uh, cultures of worklessness, three generations of families have never worked, tend to be about poor white working class people who are indigenous to the sorts of neighbourhoods that we talked to. That's why we didn't interview them, but you're absolutely right in terms of yeah experiences of destitution, uh, you will probably, you, you'd be absolutely right to be focusing on the sorts of groups you talk about. Okay, one more. Susan? Sorry, there, there was somebody going in ahead of you. We'll be back at these issues later. I'm Susan Archibald for the Archibald Foundation. Um, you never really mentioned very much about postcode lotteries, eh? Can I live in Fife where I've worked for the last God knows how many years with young folk that you to learn them to tell white lies to actually get an interview for a job because if they said they were for Kelty, Benati or Balingari, they didn't even get to an interview. You had to learn them for to say, hey, you've got an auntie in Dunfermline and an auntie in Cowdenbeath, that you could put that on the form and as quick as they get the interview, if they're offered the job, then to go back and say to the wage clerk, and by the way, I'm actually back, Stein, this is my address, so they weren't committing any crime, so to speak. Eh? Now, that had a huge effect on not just young folks' lives, but everybody's life, so to speak. Eh? But a bigger negative effect was education. So many folk with disabilities out there didn't get the right education that they need. Then they fall into every bracket that you had on your last slide because they become excluded. Then they get into bother. Then they just go down a spiral. Eh? But I have to say, on one hand, working with folk like that, so many of them are so bloody determined for to fight back and change their lives. They actually cope a lot better than burdens that come from upper class situations that are deprived with love because their parents earn that much money. They just come home, they've had a stressful day, hand them money and want them out their faces. And that is where a lot of mere things okay. come into play. Thanks. Let's staff. see if we can get our colleague point in here too because you were just pipped at the post there. Let's see uh, Caroline Mockford. Um, I was just wondering, do disability issues have any impact on your findings? Okay, so sort of postcode inequalities, disability inequalities, educational inequalities. Yes. <laughs> go on. Go on. Postcode lottery, <laughs> uh, very interesting question, and it's something I've been interested in with respect to Teesside for a long time. In Teesside, I don't think it happens. Uh, there might be lots of reasons for that. Whether it does... You were saying it, it does in the Scottish context, Glasgow context, I can understand why it might do. Uh, but I think one of the issues is, uh, certainly in Teesside, there are so many deprived neighbourhoods or stigmatised neighbourhoods. Uh, you know, there's a whole long list. It's not just that there's that 
inverted commas, bad area. There's all sorts of different areas. There's a study being published just recently by the Joseph Roundtree Foundation, which is looking very closely at a nice method, sent CVs off to different employers and you know, just changed the name of the place. And it wasn't using any Scottish places, I don't think, but it concluded that postcode discrimination doesn't really happen very much for young people. But I can understand why there might be different contexts in Scotland. Okay. Yeah, just a quick point on um, the education question. Yes, education is crucial. And it was interesting that um, the patterns of difficulties in education and being failed by education were repeated through the generations. But, and you know, we would say that education might be one answer. We work in an educational institution. But in having said that, the sorts of jobs that the majority of our interviewees do the majority of the time don't really require any sort of formal educational qualifications. So I think there are some big questions about, you know, the labour market, the segment of the labour market we might be talking about, and what, what people require to, to be able to do those, those sorts of jobs. Um, and the, the question about disability, yes, it was absolutely central, certainly for the, for the mid-generation, because there was just a preponderance of, of disability and ill health, and that was central to what, what happened. And in some ways, that was, that was the thing that was common across all of the families. I'm going to finish with one yes. quote. Yeah? So, we interviewed a woman, I think we call all the names are pseudonyms. So, Johanna did the interviews in Glasgow. She interviewed a woman called Michelle Gordon. And she told a story that, of the sort you've heard this morning. When Johan turned the tape recorder off, Michelle just sort of banged the table and said, how can you work when you've got a life like mine? And it felt like that to us as researchers. It felt, sometimes it just felt st mm. stupid and a bit obscene for us to be trolling up as researchers with agendas about employability and employment mm. and why you haven't got a job when you understood the sorts of lives that people were leading. Tracy Sheldrick and Rob McDonald, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much.